tell the people something motivational in Spanish right now. Toma poder en tus manos. Take power into your hands. Cambia tu mente primero. Entonces, toca la gente. I said, change your mind first, and then you can touch the people. All right, y'all. Desire's energy is already here. I had a brain fart. That's why I was sitting there thinking. But we have a very radical person. We have some, 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 we have a black girl next to us. But her name together says radical black girl. You feel me? And I don't, I don't even want her to talk. I just want her to listen. She is a fashion designer. She's a stylist. She's an artist. She can rap. She can dance. She can sing. She does graphic designs. She might do a little graffiti. So, you know what I'm saying? Just keep your houses clean. But regardless, she's everything that you want your baby girl to be when she grows up. And we have the opportunity, Desire's Energy, had the blessing to do a collaboration with her. And now we're about to go ahead and finally interview her since it's been so many years and she's just been cultivating these talents over and over again. I mean, look at the hat she has on right now. It's all leather, not pleather, leather. Just introduce yourself. I, I, I did my best. Just introduce i know i just scratched the surface you just scratched the surface i gotta project because i got people over here and people over here so what's up y'all my name is destiny polk i am the founder of radical black girl radical black girl is an art activist platform i like to say that i stand at the intersection of arts advocacy and education so anything that has to do with uplifting um, black and indigenous people Anything that has to do with advocating for black artists to get paid fairly for their contribution to culture and history. Um, anything that has to do with creating more access. I like to say that when I step my foot in the door, I bust it open for anybody to come in after me. So anything that I do, whether that's dance, multimedia, performance, film, fashion, um, what else do I want to say? I don't know. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out as we go. I'm into storytelling. I need to know your story. She has the story of a 100-year-old woman, but she's only in her 20s. So I need you to tell me, uh, take me back to 10-year-old Destiny and just kind of walk me up to right now. Like, tell me. Uh, let's start off keeping it simple. What inspired you to get into dance and performing and things of that nature? Okay. Um, I've actually been dancing since I was four years old. So that's way before 10. But um, I always have to shout out my grandmother and my mom. They took me to my first dance audition when I was four years old, and I haven't stopped uh, dancing since. What did you audition for? I auditioned for the Nutcracker. <laughs> did, you, did you get it? Yes, of course I did. Okay. <laughs> I was I was professionally dancing by the time I was five. People were buying tickets Wait, to see I mean, the Nutcracker. I mean, there's some footage then. There must be in yeah, know, some type of archive. Oh yeah. my gosh, I was the most extra dancer. Like in ballet, they have like numbers, so I was always number one or number two. Cause I was the smallest, mm -hmm. but I was also like the most extra dancer. So I always had like a little extra part that they assigned me to do. The yeah, I definitely stole the show. <laughs> okay, that was dance, but you do so many other things. So where did the where did the graphic design and the cut and sew and all where did that come about? Because I think that was more recent, right? Yeah, I would say. Um, for design, my grandmother actually taught me how to sew. Okay, so <laughs> it looks like we need to interview her grandmother because her grandmother is the goat for everything. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to my grandma. Anybody from Boston who knows her knows that she's a legend. So um, my grandmother taught me how to sew by hand when I was eight. And that inspired my passion to 
eventually want to be a fashion designer. Like when I was 10 years old and somebody asked me, what did you want to be when you grew up? I said a journalist and a fashion designer. And then I just went on and became a dancer and a poet for so many years. So during COVID, when so many different things slowed down, a lot of dance opportunities stopped. And I mean, the world stopped. And um, I was going through my healing process. I decided that that was the perfect time to invest my time into finally going after my dream of learning how to use a sewing machine, getting my first mannequin, and just starting As for there. graphic design, um, I feel like, I don't remember how old I was, but do you remember the paint function on like the old yeah, computers? Like Microsoft Art. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I used to do like paint pictures just on the computer as a young kid. Mm-hmm. And like the box computer. Yeah, like, like the bit like, like with the big back. Yeah, yeah. I was doing stuff graphically on computers ever since we had one. So I taught myself how to code like by using MySpace when that was a thing. And um, I don't know, I just always been into visual art, so it just translated. You said you taught yourself how to code on MySpace? Yeah. <laughs> just randomly. It's like when I look back at... <laughs> yeah, like before all this was a thing. So uh, visual art, whether it's like in my hand or on a screen, it just... It's just a language that I speak, and over time, through creating my own brand and learning how to use, you know, color stories, learning how to compose images, is just I just get better. So yeah, I'm pretty I'm pretty much self taught in in all of that. You mentioned languages. Can you tell us? Uh, I believe you are you know a little bit of some different languages out there. So I know I know only uno languages you feel me but i know you know quite a different few so yes, can you I tell us what you one know other one other language oh it sounds so good that it sounds like many what is it i know spanish <laughs> speak some spanish to the people that's watching this okay spanish. hola mi gente y mi familia en el mundo gracias por tu atención en este momento um estamos en la mes de Historia Negros, y yo soy destino. I said we're in yeah, Black History yeah, Month. Okay. <laughs> you could fact check me. I said yeah. hello. Tell, tell, tell the people something motivational in Spanish right now. Okay. For our Spanish viewers. Let me use this as a clip. Tell them something motivational. Toma poder en tus manos. Take power into your hands. Cambia tu mente primero. Entonces, toca la gente. I said, change your mind first, and then you can touch the people. Mm, that's going to be the snippet for Instagram, for sure. So, we're all about bringing value to the audience, for sure. So, because you have many talents, we're going to have to dissect this. Okay. To go step by step, so that way people can have some that they uh, really can, you know, take away. That they can start implementing themselves. So, I want to stick with, let's say, let's go with dance, right? You started off at four years old. You've been doing it throughout these next, you know, I don't want to say her age, but, you know, these next 20-something years. years. Emphasis on that, you know. So you also teach dance or you've taught dance. So I want to know what are three pieces of advice that you have for up and coming dancers or you know young girls that want to get into dance what are three pieces of concrete advice you could give them the first piece of advice that i would give a young dancer is to love your body um in different styles of dance um they may put pressure on you to have to look a certain way um Some places may even put pressure on you to have to weigh a certain weight. Um, But like even even as a a black girl, I was told that um, my back was too arched or I've been told, oh, your feet are too flat or you're too skinny or then you're too thick, you know, and all of that doesn't matter. Like 
doesn't matter what size you are, what shape you come in, love your body for how you show up and know that that's enough. So that's my first piece of advice. Second piece of advice is to study. (laughs) You will never be good at anything if you don't study your craft. So study how? Read books, watch um, I mean as a dancer that's like that's watching videos, like studying choreographers of the past and present that are inspiring to you. Um that means but that okay um that look studying your craft specifically in dance that looks like um listening to to different styles of music and knowing how to dance on different counts um if you're studying different genres like let's say you're studying uh african diasporic dances then you want to study the names of those dances and where they come from you want to study the history and the folklore um which just means the stories behind what you're doing. So you never want to be somebody who appropriates, even if you're in hip hop. You know, hip hop is something that comes natural to certain black people like myself. You grew up, you grow up learning certain social dances just at home. But there's a history behind hip hop as a style as well. So you want to learn your history about you know, the people that came before you and not just like show up and think, you know, everything. So, so it's not enough to just copy movements. It's not a, if you want to be a master and you want to be a teacher, it's not enough to just copy. Like you have to know what you're talking about and, and know the history behind the movement that you're, that you're doing. So that's two. two. So we said one, love your body Two, study, know your craft. Um, I'm going to go back to the first one. Okay, third step to somebody who wants to be a dancer. Confidence. Confidence is everything. Dance is a language. Um, Dance is spiritual. Dance is a lifestyle. But any good dancer has confidence in their expression. Like, any good dancer is not trying to be like somebody else. They're just so confident in themselves that they could be standing still for 60 seconds and you'd be like, wow, that's powerful because they're confident in it. So that's my answer. So she gave us three hardcore steps. So pieces of advice. I want to know for step one, because I'm curious. I'm not a dancer, I'm not anything, but I'm curious. The love your body. To preface, I don't believe you should ever hate your body. As in, you know, have self-destructive thoughts about yourself. But if the person is overweight and for whatever reason they, you know, have bad eating habits, they they want to dance, but they haven't thought about exercising in any way to get in shape to prepare themselves. Um, where does the love your body part come in where it's not delusion versus positive versus negative in a sense? So loving your body, um, if you're somebody who's overweight, that's the most important time to love your body. Because some people tell themselves that, oh, I have to be a certain weight before I can do this, before I can wear this, before I can feel comfortable doing this. But I teach from a place of start where you are. So, just, so basically you're saying just start. Just start. The process. Okay. I've taught dance classes where people have had to sit in chairs. They can't even stand because they, they're not comfortable standing. But that doesn't mean that they can't move their upper body. That doesn't mean that they can't move to the beat. That doesn't mean that they can't get the, you know, feel the pleasure of music, you know. So I say from some from somebody who wants to just dance, just dance doesn't matter about what it looks like at first. You know, it matters about how it feels within you first. Yeah. Now, that was some good advice for sure. And I hope all 
young men and young women definitely take heed to that keep that in mind because the majority of things in life are mental so what you tell yourself repeatedly will definitely i don't even like using this word but it would definitely manifest in your actions so if you don't think you can do it then it's not it's not too many other people that can convince you otherwise because you you are your biggest motivator so what you say goes 99 percent of the time so she's giving you these gems this advice but at the same time it's still up on you to make that decision she can't give you the confidence somebody asked me a couple weeks ago they said do you think you can be given desire and i said no i believe you can be inspired by someone else but you can't be given desire you can't be given passion you can you can be inspired by someone else's passion but i can't give you my passion i can't give you my desire so you have to want it for yourself in order for it to really really uh manifest in any way in your life and going past that i'm actually curious about this because with everything that i named that you uh currently do creativity is probably one of the few words that connects all of it so a lot of people don't feel as though that they are creative as a dancer as an artist as anything so how do you or how would you, if you can kind of put it into words, how do you create? How do you think of new ideas, new waves, new uh, new ways to express yourself? And I know some of it does come natural, meaning it's just innate. But some of it is also from comes from innovation with your mind. So to make the question a little more concrete, how would you suggest those artists out there those dancers out there those performers become more creative inside their thinking how do they think outside the box if you have any uh, advice to go towards that yeah so once again i would say research like that that sounds counterintuitive to creativity but um outside of just because one, I'll say, before I get into that that point about research, I will say that my creativity is a gift. It's a gift from God, like inspiration that that comes to me and through me when I'm open and just trusting the process and just enjoying the exploration, like not even really having a set outcome. That's what I call creative play. And it's important as somebody who wants to be creative to incorporate creative play at some point, which means that you're creating without the stakes of it having to be good. You're creating without the the mindset that somebody else has to think that it's dope. Without the pressure pressure, is just for fun. Like, don't forget to have fun for yourself in the process to try something new. That's how you innovate. So that's one thing. And then on the other side of that, for somebody who's like wants to create from a place of depth, um, that's where research comes in. So I'll talk specifically about fashion since that's what our collaboration is based off of. So before I started sewing, I did research. I was watching documentaries about black street fashion about hip-hop fashion, about the pioneers of hip-hop fashion and style. I would watch Project Runway, seasons of um, fashion show competitions. I was doing research on fashion sketches. How do you sketch a body? Um, How do you sketch clothing on a body? How do you sketch a body? body? You're so annoying. How you catch a body? So I would do, and then I would just, I had a whole um, sketchbook of just, before I even started getting into designing clothes, I was just drawing whatever would come to me. And I would draw these designs that were so intricate that at the time I didn't have the skills to make them. But I would just drew what I thought was dope what I thought was different, what I thought wasn't out there. So specifically in fashion, creativity is 
about knowing what has already come before you so that you know what you like and what you don't like. It's about being able to see trends because you should be able to see, okay, I see this trending this way. I'm at a point now in in fashion where I can predict trends before they come. You know what that's actually called? What? Like, obviously, it's trends when it comes to fashion and uh, the fashion industry, but they actually call that pattern recognition. Right. And that goes for any type of uh, field or endeavor where at some point, especially with experience, you start noticing patterns. Like, just like you said, you can and you can innovate on top of patterns, but you can see, OK, this this type style, this type color goes in this type environment, this yeah. type setting, this type season. So. Yeah. Like we said, I just want to point that out because I've spoken about it before. Pattern recognition, you get that with experience, but through research, like she's saying. The more you research, the more you can connect the dots. And once you know there's trends and patterns, it starts to become even easier to be innovative because now you know having a foundation is very important. Right. And that's something that people don't think about. It's like the better foundation you have based on truth, especially the better you're able to innovate on top of that. But if you don't have a basic foundation on truth, then it's going to be hard to create an innovation that actually works because it's a difference between being creative and then being creative that actually uh, speaks to people that actually connects with the audience. Yeah. So I would say um, as an artist, it doesn't matter what your medium is. It's good to start with a topic. Start with the theme. Start with the things that matter the most to you. No one's going to create about something that they don't care about. So if you care about talking about black hair and you're a poet, then that's a good place to start is talking about your journey with your black hair. If you're a photographer and you really care about celebrating motherhood, then you might want to have a subject or have subjects that are black mothers, for example. You know, like, I'm the founder of Radical Black Girl. I've always looked up to historic black figures, um, revolutionaries, the Black Panther Party. And so it only made sense to eventually come to a creation like what I'm wearing on my head. And it's something that I actually don't even have to say. People recognize because it, it has a language in itself, you know, so... Find that topic that you're passionate about. Find a blueprint. And I would say, you know, not everything that's creative is complicated. Creative doesn't equal complicated. So you can start off with something simple and simply by adding your unique perspective to something that's simple can make it creative. That was a, that was, that was a bar right there. We good? So at 30, I'm going to stop the video and check the audio to make sure that we ain't talking to a blank mic right now. Yeah, yeah, because that's why we got to do it all. Yeah, yeah. Appreciate y'all for tapping in with Radical Black Girl on the Desire Is Energy podcast. But now what you were saying, though, I definitely, the last part, especially when it comes to simplicity, because that's what over the last few weeks that I've been talking with you about and many people is that. I'm actually learning to simplify our message because at first I was so caught up into trying to put, you still want the detail, but you have to learn to condense what your message is, what your mission is to people. The better, the quicker and faster and easier you communicate your mission and your message or even your, your uh, creativity to people, the better response you're going to get, the more people you're going to, uh, convert the more people are going to resonate with your message like Nike just do it the more simple your message is the better people can attach to it and say oh yeah I, I, I want to be a part of that movement I want to be a part of that because when we started off it was you know once you we still do it but we don't do it as much we used to be like once you get the desire you'll get the energy and then we would go into super detail like oh you know imagine if you you know, have a hobby and we'll tell this full story, which was great. But once we learned to make it condense everything into a shorter package, 
where now is we telling them what we're doing, not just what we represent, but actually what we're trying to do. We want to inspire action and everybody with desires in life. It's quick. It's simple. It's like, OK, now I know what these people are about. Now, let me look into their creativity. Let me look into uh, everything else that they have going on. So it's almost going back to your why. Once you yourself authentically know what your why is, then your creativity can almost have a mind of its own. But until then, until you have a specific message that you're trying to get across, then it'll be difficult to think of new ideas and new concepts. Because now that I think about it, some of the greatest artists, even though it might have just been a painting, a lot of times those paintings had a message behind it. And it was up to sometimes it was up to the viewer to decide what that message is. But if you were to ask the original artists, they could tell you in depth, this color represents this, this uh, scene represents this, this line and drawing, even though to the naked eye, it may appear to be completely different. So I just like I, said, I just got into a little flow for a second, but I want to get back to the radicalness right next to me. What made you come up with the name Radical Black Girl? Because, you know, like nobody said radical white dude or, you know, radical this or, you know, crazy that. So it's like the name itself is a powerful name that sticks out when people first hear it. And I'm sure that's part of the reason why you stuck with it. But also, what was going through your mind? What was going through Destiny J. Polk's mind? Whether you was four years old or 20 or whatever age you were, and you just said, you was just, <laughs> radical black girl. Like, where did it come from? So, I came up with the name radical black girl. It was... <laughs> it was, It was during winter break of my sophomore year of college, I think. Actually, it might have been my freshman year. I don't know. It, but I know I, I actually came to Houston for winter break, and um, I had a journal, and I was just journaling, imagining images of – my future self and I went to the library with my older brother and I knew I wanted to start a platform so originally I had a blog um, called the grapevine and I would post like poetry and um, different stuff that was around black history mm -hmm. and so I knew I wanted to start another blog but I didn't know what to call it. So I was just writing down all words that I felt like aligned with me. Mm -hmm. And like I said before, I did do research. So I chose out of all the words, and I, it was a page probably of like over 50 words, um, I came up with Radical Black Girl. And... Well, I, I kind of reverse engineered it. So I came up with words like audacious, empowered. Mm -hmm. I came up with um, words like bold, um, fierce, just and what fashionable, different things that I felt like, adjectives. adjectives that I felt like encompassed the person I wanted to be, not even necessarily the person that I was at that time, mm -hmm. but the, the image that I strived to become. So Radical Black Girl became the persona, the platform. And Radical, a lot of people kind of shy, some people, depending on, you know, who you are, shy away from the term because of the stigma behind it in the American context of, oh, that means you're a terrorist or, oh, that means, you know, you're dangerous or whatever. But the root of the word radical, which means the history of it, literally means to be rooted. Radical means to be rooted. So to be rooted in what? To be rooted in self-knowledge, to be rooted in my own identity and my own history, to be rooted in myself. So radical actually means to be rooted. Black, because I'm black, 
because black is all encompassing because black is global because black is everything and the absence of black is the source and i chose girl because girl is historically underserved girls are what's the word i want to use kind of like i want to like the underdogs but there's a word yeah. for it not inferior most definitely not inferior um underestimated is the word girls are underestimated girls are the least protected um we are the least of a threat perceived perceived as a threat you think, you think that well, not you think you guys are the least, the least protected in America. Yes, I think that girls are the least protected in the world. No, no, I agree in the foreign countries. I'm talking about in the, you, you think in America where a woman can, I ain't gonna post up and really ask you now, where ladies can accuse a dude of rape and that dude get fired, have all these issues going on, find out she was lying. One, I told you stop using rape as an example, but two. Yes, girls are the okay, least protected. Black girls, girls of color are the most, are the, the ones that are missing. They're, they are the ones that be, are being raped. They are the ones that are being thrown out of school. They're not protected by any of the systems that exist. I just feel like black boys aren't either, though. That's true, but I'm specifically talking about why I chose radical black girl. I'm not saying that that cancels out the fact that black boys are not protected either. Young people in general in this country are not this country's priority. But from a global perspective, girls as the gender are the least protected. And so I chose radical black girl as the name because radical and black are already so powerful that the girl part softens the message but still says no. Like we are the ones that are protected. We are the ones that are going to be the next leaders. So, and a lot of people feel like, oh, well, if it's radical black girl, do you work with men? Do you work with boys? Yes, I do. And, I, and also the history of the word girl actually didn't have a gender. It just meant young person. Only, only into like modern day history did girl actually be assigned to a young lady. But before it just meant young person, period. So... I'm actually curious, when did the term boy come into play? I don't know. Did a boy ever exist? At some point it came into play. Cause, I just know the history of what I researched. Because yeah. hmm. I always wonder about, <clears throat> this is going more to religion, where it makes a distinction between men and women. And I'm about to go back and read now, because now that I think about it, when the parts in the Bible talks about, I don't know if I ever said the word girl, or if it said just child or something, but I'm actually curious now to see whether or not, especially in the religious books, unless it's been updated, where whenever it said girl, could it have just been referring to a young person and not like an actual young mm -hmm. uh, woman, exactly. Mm -hmm. But I'm actually curious as well because, especially with the hat, there's some resemblance I believe people are going to notice very quickly when they see that. Mm -hmm. Did the, was there any inspiration from a, cause we talked about research. Is there any inspiration when it comes to the past from the black Panther party in any way, when it comes to the, uh, some of the styles that you put out with your radical black girl platform? Um, yeah, originally I started making hats. I started making bucket hats and I made them in all different styles. So there wasn't really any inspiration to that other than the fact that I liked bucket hats. Um, and it was a good way to practice. And then eventually, um, I started making berets and I didn't even start making them in, in leather until it evolved, right? Like everything that I did was a very organic process and so I started off just using recycled materials. So I would take like pants and make it into a hat or something like that. Um, and then 
one day it just something kind of clicked where I said, okay, what, what is your brand though? Like be, beside just being sustainable, beside just doing unique one of a kind pieces, what's a staple? What does that look like? And that's when I found the, the black leather look and my original hat has the radical black girl logo on it. Um, and yeah, so I, I guess it was, it was just a natural, um, ode to the black Panther party without being like, I'm going to remake a black Panther hat. It was, it was like, I'm going to make a radical black girl hat. And because it's a black leather hat and I wear it tilted to the side, then it kind of already gives that, that look. But as people yes of course I look up to people like Asada Shakur I look up to people like Angela Davis you know I look up to people like Fred Hampton I look up to um people like Stokely Carmichael you know um people who were radical people who were revolutionary um in in their messages and in the way that they lived their life so yes it is a fashion statement for people who are bold enough to claim themselves as a radical creator or black women who are bold enough to wear a hat that says radical black girl on the front of it, whether they identify as a girl or not, but identify with the message, it's a message. And it's it's a message that is understood and is lived by, by how you see the world. Do you believe that anybody... Oh, no, let me make a better question. Do you believe that everyone is creative? It's a very vague question for a reason. I don't know. Do you believe everyone? Because I know that anyone, that's obviously, but do you believe everyone is creative? Just as a blanket statement. Um, I believe that everyone has the potential to be creative. Um... I think that creativity doesn't always equal artistic. Mm -hmm. I think those are two different things. So, and not to get like super biblical, but (laughs) but creative, uh, I think in the biblical essence is just the process of being um, and continuing to become. So, in that sense if you are God's creation you being in your essence and being fruitful and whatever that is is a sense of create creativity so a farmer can be creative like you can be create you can creatively plant different things and then creatively figure out how to use those plants to make different things you know like you can be a creative chef you can creatively you know, people who are incarcerated are the probably the most creative people in existence because they have to be. Yeah. Create, you know, creating something out of nothing, you know. So people who live in poverty are the most creative people. We creatively recycle because we have to. Resourcefulness is, is a function of creativity, yes. So I think I think everybody has the potential to be creative and it it doesn't have to live in a museum. So, yeah, I agree 100 percent when in regards to creativity, um, because I used to be a pessimist in that area. I used to think, you know, only some people have it. Some people don't kind of like what you said earlier about how you it was a talent creativity. But now what I really understand creativity really comes from is just to paraphrase basically what you were already saying is authenticity. The biggest way to be creative is by being authentic because no two people are exactly alike. You can be 99% similar, but there's no two people on earth that are exactly 100% the same. So the best ways to, because the whole point of being creative is to some extent it's about being different. And the best way to be different is being 100% yourself, authentic, not trying to copy. I said this yesterday, people forget copycats. They don't forget authenticity. Right. And that's one of the biggest things because a lot of people, 
they think, oh, I don't have any great ideas or I don't have any new innovative things I want to do. I don't have any special talents. But you being yourself 100 percent and more importantly, communicating that to people, you will be remembered a lot better. (laughs) You'll be remembered a lot more for that than the person that is talented but they're copying someone else the person that's imitating that can sing like michael jackson dance like him do spins and imitate him they'll be more forgettable than someone such as us who are actually doing what's authentic to us because authenticity is the only thing that brings out the most creativity and uniqueness and I just wanted to add that because what you were saying, because a lot of people, especially in my case, I used to not believe in, you know, the creativity and stuff like that. But like you said, it's not just about it's not just about um, the art. It's also about the aut- authenticity. Your message has creativity to it when it's authentic to you. And I'm looking at you dead in the camera. Yes, you when your message, no matter how lame you think your story is, no matter how uninteresting you believe you are. Your specific message, what you've learned, what you've accumulated over your life, that is the biggest and communicating that to people, which is just as important. That is the our biggest form of creativity because it's not rehearsed. It's not copied. So for the church folk, I would say your testimony will make a way for you. That's another way of saying it, depending on, you know, what you've been through and in, in life, the things that have formed your character um the parts of your story that nobody else would know unless you said something about it those are usually the defining moments that will actually change your life for the better if you learn how to hone in on your message and use that to empower you um versus be the thing that keeps you down or keep or holds you back so a lot of people especially in in the poetry world they turn their pain into purpose like as I was just saying um on the IG live I'm at a point now where I can I can speak up on my testimony and say yes I have been a missing person yes I have been held as a political prisoner and been silenced yes I am a survivor of rape and domestic abuse Yes, I am somebody who has been displaced or homeless, but all of those things don't make me any less than, but actually make my story so much more powerful because I can say I survived that and I can say I'm doing things to actively change that reality, not only for myself, but for other people who come after me. And I can say that without shame. So once you get to that point and say, none of those things like define your soul and who you are but they're a part of your story so use whatever it is that you have for the good for good or for bad and turn it into your superpower <clears throat> no, facts it's powerful everything you've gone through and continue to go through is shaping you into the person that you're becoming or that you need to become every lesson that you learn every experience that you have is teaching you something the lessons are usually small and incremental but in hindsight when you look back it prepares you for what you have to do later on and a lot of times we don't really see the we don't see the connection from the lesson early on until it's you know really far down the road and I think the reason why it's hard to see that is because you know the way people are taught growing up especially you know in the school age is you study for two or three weeks, you take an exam. You study for two or three weeks, you take an exam. So everything is so quick and kind of lumped together. So you're used to kind of like immediate feedback. Mm. But in real life, lessons are learned more so through taking tests after tests after tests, failing tests after tests after tests, going back, saying, okay, how did I fail this? And then like re kind of like reconstructing and working backwards. So the lessons you feel in life, in hindsight, you have to look back and say, OK, what did I, what did I learn from this situation? Or if anything, what did this situation teach me about people? What did this situation like me reaching out to the police, me reaching out to them and nobody responded, me asking for help, everyone laughing, nobody, uh, you know, wanting to do it. 
all of these things are teaching you lessons about human nature. It's teaching you things that, okay, so as I get older and grow, I'll be able to handle more and more. Like what was a big deal to me at 20 won't be a big deal to me at 35. What was a big deal to me at 35 won't be a big deal to me at 60 because I'm constantly learning and putting, storing things in my mind say, okay, so I know this could happen. I know if I open that storefront, the workers might steal from me. I know that we could get robbed. I know like when you think of all these things that happen, as long as it didn't kill you, it grows you, it grows your uh, tolerance and your ability to stay calm under that same pressure later on because you've already dealt with it. So the days that you break down and, you know, want to cry or feel so down those times that you feel later on, you're going to grow almost like an extra layer of skin to those same situations. Cause you're going to remember how you got through it in the past. So I am somebody who is very empathetic and I can um, feel very deep emotions and um, growing up I would and I would say up until even very recently um, I I've had a tendency to take on the weight of the world and to be hyper aware of the tragedies and the injustice that happens specifically to black and indigenous people um, in, in America, but worldwide. And something that I've had to, because of the things that I've actually endured in my body and the things that I've witnessed, I have had to grow that extra layer of skin that you were just talking about because I have to protect myself emotionally, spiritually, psychically, mentally, however you want to say it, so that I don't let so much in that I allow myself to be hurt in from the inside out. So it's a it's a level of knowing that being aware bad things happen. Bad things happen to good people and injustice at this point in society is not it's not stopping. You know, unless it's met with an opposition, but all that to say is that I don't, I'm not ignorant to the fact that bad things happen, even to me. I'm just more emotionally rooted in faith and in the current reality of like, I have to check, am I safe right now? Am I mentally okay right now? Am Am I stable enough right now to see the world or this reality for for what it is right now? Because when you're somebody who does want to put themselves what in, in activist terms right on the front line, you want to put yourself right in the direct line of potential danger. Um, I realized through my own experiences that. I don't have to risk my life every single time something happens. My life is so important that I owe it to myself and to others to preserve myself, actually, and not be so reckless with my own life and use it as a chess piece in a game that if I die, I don't win. So... That's something that I've had to to use and and learn over time. I can only learn that through experience. It's to say a younger destiny would have been more reckless and has been. A younger destiny has definitely put herself in very scary situations and tested the, the limits. But an older, more mature destiny would say, yeah, that's upsetting, but you knew that you know that that's going on. And what is your longer term goal rather than a shorter, like you said, instant feedback? Because I'm realizing that, like Nipsey said, it's a marathon, right? So I may not be able to be a first responder to that specific instance. I may not have the energy. I may not have the, the protection 
or whatever the case is to to be there at that moment. But I have the foresight and the vision to say, but I'm going to be there in the long run to make sure that systematically or over time, I'll be a part of the reason why this country is a safer place. Or I'll be the, I'll be a part of the solution as to this specific sanctuary exists so that these issues that we're dealing with right now will not be something that we're dealing with in the future, if that makes sense. No, it makes it makes perfect sense. There's something while you were speaking, it made me think about experiences in life as you progress is about discovering truths. People, some people call it reality, but it's discovering truths. Situations that you're put in that you might have, when you were young, you were naive to the truths of uh, realities of what happens in those situations. As you go through them, whether they were self-caused or not, as you go through them, you learn those truths and you're able to operate at a more efficient way later on. It's like, it's like any fighter, any athlete, when they first start off, they work a lot harder to produce the same results. It's a lot of unnecessary movement, a lot of, you know, because they don't know the truths yet and how to, you know, move mechanically, like what saves energy, what loses energy, what works and what doesn't work. So as we get, as we grow and progress, these different realities that we discover meaning we discover how people are we discover what happens when you go to sell a product and nobody buys it we discover like once we know these different truths all that knowledge that we accumulate over time allows us to be as you were saying better prepared in the future and that's the and that's a big difference between what a lot of people they think about you know giving up on their dreams and their desires saying oh you know reality kicked in but it's not about giving up on your dreams, your passions and your desires. What it's about is going in with more knowledge of how to do it later on, as opposed to less. When you first start off as a child, you have all the biggest goals and desires. It's because you don't know any of the truths yet. But at once you discover those truths, it shouldn't deter you from that goal. What it should do is it should help you become better prepared to try a different way next time in order to keep achieving it. Or to keep trying to go after it once you learn that you t- talk to a hundred people and only five of them actually buy what that teaches you is next time i need to talk to 500 when i talk to 500 and only 30 of them buy that teaches me okay i got to figure out how to talk to this me i got to figure out how to change what i'm saying all of these truths that you discover which is reality in life like not going to certain environments where everybody you know drinking and got guns and stuff you know something could happen because you had an experience or you know a friend that had an experience those are truths positive or negative those are truths that that are that's that's part of reality so as you learn these truths your job as you grow is to learn to navigate them differently meaning be more prepared for a situation that could get out of hand because you know it's possible when you're young you don't think it's possible you don't think going out with your friends Y'all all 17, you know, been drinking, doing so. You don't think it's a problem. Once you get older and see what's happening to other people or even to yourself, you know that that's an issue. So now you say before you put your foot in the car, you think, OK, I know the reality that could happen from this situation. Is this a good idea? Yes or no. It depends. But that's all it is. It's not saying that you lose your desires and say, you know what, let me just try to be average and play it safe. Cause there's no such thing as playing it safe. What it's about is re it's like going back to the huddle, recap, recalibrating your game plan and coming out even stronger every time as you learn and get new information, which is again, discovery. It's like physics. You, once you discover gravity, someone I read something, it was, uh, it's kind of like a joke, but it said, talking about for people that, you know, that believe in, uh, kind of like the manifest but not manifestation but it was to some extent people that believe you can just kind of wish things into existence and then saying basically like it said if you don't believe in gravity you'll be surprised to find that gravity believes in you Hmm. meaning you try to jump off a building you may not believe you're gonna fall but i'm sure gravity believes that you're gonna come down so it's like at some point that's a truth right we all can have our own realities mentally, but there are some truths that we discover 
that helps shape our mindset and how we navigate. So even if you believe you can fly, you notice the Wright brothers then jump off a cliff barehanded. They 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 saw the reality, <laughs> the truth that gravity exists and gravity believes in us more than we believe in it. So it said, you know what? Let's recalculate our plans and come up with something else that could cause us to take flight. You know what I'm saying? So what you're trying to do is going to come it's going to come in a different way than you expect, because you, as you learn new truths, you're going to navigate differently. So you're going to get to that end result. But it's going to be different than what you anticipate when you don't know the truths of what's actually going to happen or what the different routes you must or the obstacles you'll have to face. That's true. I'll speak to that. Um and I'll speak to that in a very like practical sense, right? So with fashion, um, with cut and sew, with creating things from scratch, um, there's always a process of how you think it's gonna go, and then there's the truth of how it actually happens. So, in in the case of create creating and production on a level of excellence right always account for human error always account for the fact that something might mess up that's beyond your control even like sewing machines people are intimidated by sewing machines for a reason because it's technology that it's simple but complicated that can mess up just just because you won't even know you have to figure it out and so even with the process of I might say okay one hat might take me 30 minutes but am I accounting for the fact that I intend to make 20 hats and then you know me I'll try, <laughs> I'll try last minute destiny will try to make 20 hats for the next day for a pop-up shop and in my mind, that seems like a pretty reasonable reality. But the truth is that because I'm a perfectionist and I want everything to look the right way, I'm not going to rush and put something out that I don't believe in myself. The truth is, is that everything has a flow. And so the truth that I'm... The, what I want to get to is that I'm learning that I function better in a flow state of taking my time where I can be grateful for what I'm doing, where I can put on a sermon or something meditative and be intaking information that's feeding my spirit as I'm creating. So I can create from a state of a peaceful pace rather than creating from a state of frantic rushed anxiety state so right before we actually came i actually wrote something down in my notes because it came to me while i was i was uh driving here most people think fast and act slow mm. which i believe creates anxiety when you're thinking i should be doing this i should be doing that should but you're moving slow and I'm not a therapist. I'm saying for me, I operate best and I believe it's best to think slowly, more importantly, thoroughly. And once you've come to a concrete decision, act fast. Mm. I believe that leads to more peace. Kind of like what you're saying when you because it's mental when you're able to have mental clarity, take your time and focus on what you're doing. The actions, whether they're slow or not you have more peace than when you're thinking frantically, you're thinking very quickly, but your actions aren't able to keep up. Mm. And I believe that's where, again, I don't have any anxiety disorders, uh, no medical issues whatsoever. So thank God for that. But I would say for all the people that are healthy out there who do experience anxiety, I believe that a cure to that is based on thinking slower Thinking thoroughly, like writing things out, taking your time and coming to a decision. And once you've made your decision, act fast instead of what most people do who, again, are not medically diagnosed. They think fast 
but their actions are slow or they can't keep up. So therefore it produces more pressure and anxiety because you're overthinking what you should be doing instead of just slowing it down and saying, okay, let me think, think for these next three days, come to my final decision, then act fast, act fast, move quick. But most people, what they do is they think fast the whole time and then they're acting slow, which is putting them in a state of, uh, I ain't gonna say depression, but it's putting them in a state of anxiety and it doesn't feel good when you feel as though you aren't making any progress. But a lot of times it comes from you not being able to focus and make concrete decisions. So I would say what I've discovered is taking the time ahead of time to prepare your mind to prepare your atmosphere um, actually ends up saving you time on the back end. So you might feel like, oh, I can't afford to spend an hour of preparation. But when you actually, like you said, take the time to slow down, it may only take you 15 minutes of focused effort of preparation. And that focused effort to prepare that you only really learn over time through trial and error, then that you have, it it clears the way for a longer flow state because you've already set all the things. So if that, if that means that you know that you have to sit down at your computer for two hours to get things done, that means that you should have your water prepared, your snacks ready, <laughs> whatever playlist you want to put on, your working area cleared. You know, if that if you're sewing, that means that you should have all of your thread prepared, your scissors ready, your fabric out, your cutouts ready, you know. You know what that makes me think about? Majority of successful people prepare hours to be great for minutes Mm. they prepare days to be great for hours they prepare weeks to be great for days they prepare months to be great for weeks and obviously they prepare years to be excellent for months Mm. so that preparation is very important and when you put in 10 hours of preparation it's easy to be excellent for two hours or for an hour and a half or to put on a excellent performance for 30 minutes when you've been preparing for days and weeks for it. So when you look at any person at the top of their craft, whether it's a business entrepreneur, artist, uh, even a profession, those people have put in kind of going to that 10,000 hour rule, you know, the book, the outliers talk about when you put in those thousands of hours or minutes and days preparing for things, It allows you to be at an elite level for 10 minutes or for a short amount of time. Same thing. I think I read something about Usain Bolt, how he practiced, he trained for months and years. So that way he could be elite for nine seconds. Right. You know what I'm saying? That that makes me excited um, that you broke it down like that, because like this hoodie that I'm wearing right now, I've been sewing for we'll call it two years right but I've been really we've been collaborating for just the past year the first hoodie collaboration that we did was exactly a year ago right so when the opportunity came for you to go on great day Houston for desires energy and you called me like a week before even though I've been asking you what you're going to do. <laughs> hint, hint. So he tells me, hey, we got to create, we got to recreate a hoodie, right? To be fair, I did say, I did say we can't do it, no pressure. Right, right but challenge accepted. <laughs> so the point that I'm making is I've been sewing consistently over the past two years so that even though I did wait till the night before, (laughs) but so that I had the ability to make this hoodie the night before it was on live television. Exactly. So you cultivated your skill set for years 
so that way you can do it in minutes. Or in exactly. Minutes. Cultivated my skill set over two years so that when the opportunity and the time presented itself, I could trust my ability and my and my own process to make something within an hour and it be on television the next day and be something that we can now sell to the public. That's preparation. Facts. I ain't gonna lie, we had a lot of good gems this podcast. Yeah. So it's almost felt like a weird therapy session, to be honest. Like some of it we were talking about, especially because, like I said, a lot of people, and like I said, I'm not a doctor. So for those who got the, you know, put a little paper prescription for anxiety and stuff, I'm, I'm sorry. But just going by, like I said, what we're talking about, that focus that you have, that clarity, because it's hard to have any clarity when you don't have focus. It's like having an image. If you if it's blurry, shaking, moving everywhere, you can't. It's hard if you can't focus on what you're trying to pinpoint in that image, because it's real blurry. Then it's hard for you to not have anxiety. It's hard for you to not uh, have added pressure in your mind. Clarity builds peace to some extent. That's why when people talk about purpose so much, purpose having a purpose is also having clarity about what you're trying to achieve once you have clarity about what you're trying to do a lot of pressure is taken away it's still pressure to perform it's still pressure to progress but majority of it is taken away or majority of the anxiety is taken away because you have a clear picture of what you're actually trying to do (laughs) so mark ceo of desirous energy what clarity do you have about the future of our collaborations with Radical Black Girl? What's what's a clear picture that you're painting in your head about what you want to achieve? Uh, it's time for me to focus for hours and days so I can think about it. <laughs> <laughs> so I can come back and give y'all a beautiful answer in 10 seconds. That's you feel good, me? That's But I would say, honestly, I kind of have an idea already, but I would say, to be honest, with your platform, because, like, I don't know where you, well, I have an idea where you see, but I do see your platform definitely becoming huge, uh, even going back to what you originally thought it for, talking about having a blog or, like, a magazine post, or I look at your platform as becoming, like, the hub for especially young women, but people in general to get the latest news and updates on important things going on in the black community. Important, not just political, but important, meaning the important strides and innovation, uh, technology, obviously, but, you know, sometimes political, but just with that being said for your platform, I actually, besides doing just a fashion collapse, I think that it would be great for Desire's Energy and Radical Black Girl to actually get into film. I was going to say media collapse? Yeah, because film, to me, like I said, when I talked about I don't know if I even said it on camera, but when I talked about uh, earlier about us going similar to how Disney did theirs i said that i want to create a kingdom that's based on knowledge inspiration and action Mm -hmm. and i feel as though both of our platforms are platforms that are doing that in its own sectors in a sense so i feel like our collaborations can go beyond fashion it can go into uh working with schools Mm -hmm. it can go into actual programs like you know kind of like mentor mentee type programs and then also film which is what i mentioned earliest was basically storytelling yeah. because you have your own actual documentary that you're going to be coming up with mm-hmm. and putting out we didn't get to really talk about that and with us we have a lot of different uh stories more like fables but at the same time they can actually be created into short films because i've told you about this idea before the author that I have, the short stories that she writes, they're based on concepts 
that are true or important, but they also can be adapted into animation with the right story, you know, right, the right writers. And then also it could be created into short films or even movies based on the concept if it's good enough. And I feel as though that we definitely could work together with that and create, you know, an anti my knee, a team of radical black women for different parts. Um, you'll have an entire catalog of those young women who are more importantly want to make an impact that are actually down and interested in being a part of it, you know? Yeah. But what's your idea? No, I'm when you said film, I was just thinking um that if we collaborate on some some media projects i think that they would they would reach a lot of people like even just in the the two collaborative posts that we just made about this hoodie this is just one like you said this is one example of something that we can come up with but in terms of the reach that you have in terms of the way that you communicate your ideals to people the fact that you want to spread inspiration, inf- action, and information, um, yeah, that that's literally that's literally what I'm about, right? I said advocacy, which is action, education, which is information, right, <laughs> and um, creativity or um, or art. So I'm down with that. I think that. I think that we're we're on the verge of some really dope stuff. So I think thank you for just speaking to the things that I have done in the past and things that I can reincorporate into the future. But um, I think I'm definitely getting more in, back into um, into film and media. So that's gonna I think we should do that. Okay. <laughs> you just heard a business business transaction going on, we just, we just a business that. meeting, yeah. but. Definitely, I want the audience make sure that y'all take to heart everything that we talk about here because these are conversations that I'm sure a lot of you have already had. And the deepest thing is take it slow. Focus. That's the biggest word, focus. You don't have to take it slow as in, you know, be don't procrastinate, but focus. Take time to focus. If you find that everything around you is moving real quick out and about, you know, every you know thing after thing after thing, at some point, you're going to have to miss out on certain things. Have FOMO. You're going to have fear of missing out. You're going to have to miss out on some of those perceived opportunities, on some of those uh, parties, some of those engagements, because you have to focus. Yeah. There's no one who's ever been successful that hasn't focused or had, had time to created time to focus on whatever they're doing. There's no athlete that's ever made the NBA that then focus on practice and not go out and party and hang out with girls and drink and go to these different galas and different things like that. Mm-hmm. Same thing, the same thing with, uh, like I said, even people that are in spaces where they, well, it's all about networking. At some point, you have to take time to yourself to create your own plan and your and focus in your own uh, vision yeah. because otherwise – You'll only ever be doing stuff for everybody else, but never doing anything for yourself. Let me speak to that real quick, because I know we're going over, we, we, we here though. But I was, say, I was just talking to my best friend. I said, it always seems like the moments when I go through a period of isolation is when I come out on the other side with something great. Of course. You know, Absolutely. you may not, you may not see me in person for a month. But best believe it's for a reason, because within that month, I've developed a new product. Um, I've been working on a project that had a good outcome. I popped up on the television. So you may not have seen me in person, but I was working on something and it's okay. And I want to plug my journal before we end. Okay. So we talked about, we were talking about focus. So this is a product and an example of focus. I'm gonna put it in the camera real quick. Boom, boom, boom. I'm gonna put it over here real quick. So um, this is a guided journal, Radical Black Girls Guided Journal for Wellbeing and Beyond. And um, 
a part of your well-being is being able to focus in on who you are, what makes you you, the peace that you can come back to, like we were talking about, that clarity. So I wanted to plug it. And myself, I want you to read the back and read it out loud to everybody. <clears throat> I make a difference because I am alive. I can do anything because I have a mind. To think new things, the world is a better place with me in it. My potential is a garden. I will water it. My spirit is a treasure. I will protect it. My body is a temple. I will love it. My life is a gift. I will live it. Nice. <laughs> yeah, so you can, um, you can find my Radical Black Girls Guide, Guided Journal for Wellbeing and Beyond, on my website at a radical black girl tribe.com it is written and published by myself and printed by a black owned print house in houston texas land manuel print house so um this is just an example like i had to focus in order to even get this done versus being intimidated by the thought of self-publishing right because it was something that i felt like was needed not only for myself but for other people like you can go in this journal and like there's a poem come back self where it says fill in the blanks of this poem and recite it to yourself when you're feeling like you're losing touch of who you are whenever you're anxious overwhelmed confused disconnected or acting out of character sometimes you need to hear the voice from within and then it it guides you through a prompt to be able to come back to yourself there's like there's charts in here about reclaiming my time which is what we were just talking about right it says use this chart to track the most important activities you'd like to dedicate time to to create your most fulfilling and balanced day week slash month so if you never take the time to reclaim your time everybody else is going to eat your time up and then you're not going to have no time for yourself, which is what we were just talking about, right? So if you don't make the time for healthy cooking, which is what I haven't been making time for, <laughs> okay, then that has real impact. <laughs> yeah, if you don't make the time for your spirit, then you're always going to feel unsettled. You're always going to feel unclear because you're not even going to realize what other things are impacting your spiritual well-being. If you don't take time, to grow your business then you're going to look up six months later and your business is going to be in the same place that it was six months ago yeah it's probably going to go backwards you know so all that to say is, is that there's so many different gems in my book that i created specifically for people um who need to just have something in front of them where they can feel good about the decisions that they're making and come back to reminders. So go check out my book. That's my plug. Thanks. And it was actually funny is that it's a guided journal and you already know one of our, uh, it's not new, but one of the ways we explain it better now is we say no desire is achieved without energy behind it. And then we put the second part. We say energy is pointless without a desire or direction guiding it. Right. So sometimes that direction, that guide, which is like that journal kind of helping you, create that clarity for what direction you're headed in that's just as important as having the ability to do right. because just having the ability but not knowing what you want to do with it or going in the right direction means nothing i used to meet i used to use this example slaves worked harder than everybody else in here but what they were working on unfortunately you know the situation that they were in it didn't allow them some of them to actually go after what their actual dreams and desires are so just working hard alone doesn't mean anything if you're not working on the right things you know yeah. but we don't want to go too much longer uh this has been a really great episode you know it's got to squeeze in D, this is for you, man. Desire is the fire that helps to inspire. And tell them, uh, take us out, Radical Black Girl. This has been real. It's been a podcast with Desire is Energy and Radical Black Girl. So I'm all about the radical awakening of the authentic self mm. to 
dismantle oppression. <laughs> radical expression. Dismantling oppression through radical expression and authentic connection. Is what you're seeing right here. Yeah. Let's get it. All right.